All right, thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started now. So good morning, welcome to the first uh, tutorial at ICCB. I'm Tyler Hayes and today I'll be presenting the introduction to our tutorial. I wanna thank uh, the other tutorial organizers, Ashwarya Agrawal, who was not able to be here and will give her talk remotely, uh, Jolt Kira, Massimiliano Mancini and Ricardo Volpi. Uh, so without further ado, this is visual recognition beyond the comfort zone, adapting to unseen concepts on the fly. So let's start off with a little bit of a motivating example about what we mean by the comfort zone and why it's so important to move beyond the comfort zone. So let's assume that we have some robotic agent that's been trained to identify various objects within a garden. Maybe it can identify these trees, maybe it can perform different tasks like picking fruit off the trees. But what happens now if, say, the season changes? So now all of a sudden our fruit looks a little bit different because we've moved from summer into fall or maybe into winter, or maybe different types of fruits are blooming at different times of the year. Or what happens if new items appear in the garden, right? So maybe we have new types of fruits or vegetables in the garden. We have other objects that are appearing and we'd like our robotic agent to be able to adapt to those different objects within the environment. Another thing that could happen is we have new instances or compositions of items appearing, right? So maybe at some point in the garden, we had red tomatoes, but now we have yellow tomatoes. Is our agent able to identify the concepts of yellow and tomato and put those two things together to be able to identify the new red tomatoes? And there's a lot of other things that you could imagine are really important, right? So what do we mean when we say the comfort zone? In traditional machine learning, we make this assumption that our training set contains all of the information that's needed to perform a target task, right? So basically here, when we refer to the comfort zone, we're referring to the training distribution. This is the distribution that our agent is most familiar with, it's comfortable in, and it's probably going to make the most accurate predictions in. But in practice, this is often violated. This assumption isn't always holding true, right? It's really hard to collect a training set that captures all of the diversity in the world, especially at any given point in time, right? There's many different semantic compositions or <laughs> semantic concepts. There's many different compositions of these different concepts. But more than that, right, we're living in a world that exists on a time axis, right? So it's constantly evolving. There's new types of items being produced every year. There's new things that we would like our agent to be able to adapt to over time. So why is it really important that we move beyond this training distribution or this concept uh, or this comfort zone, right? So we mentioned just a minute ago that it's really hard to collect a training set that contains all of the possible concepts. This is really expensive, right? Especially if we operate in say a supervised setting. Maybe we're not operating in a supervised setting and it's still really expensive to get the hardware we need to collect unsupervised data, right? So there's lots of expensive things that come in collecting a very large training data set. Another thing is that maybe we have some data subpopulations that are underrepresented, right? You could think of minorities or underrepresented concepts like those yellow tomato examples I gave just a few minutes ago, right? Maybe when we think of tomatoes, we immediately think of the red type of tomatoes, but a yellow tomato is still a viable object and we would still like our agent to be able to perform well when I provide it with instances of yellow tomatoes. Another thing that's really nice about going beyond the comfort zone is adaptation in general can provide us an alternative to retraining from scratch, right? We've all seen this really big boom recently uh, where it takes a really long time to train up these models. And if we get some new data, it would be nice if we didn't just have to retrain it from scratch with all of the data that it's seen before, right? Maybe it's even infeasible to do this because we've lost access to certain types of data or maybe there's privacy issues. More than this, if we don't have to retrain from scratch, perhaps we can make more green AI, right? We're just updating only when we need to on maybe a subset of the examples that we need to, to perform well on. So you can imagine how this is really important for safety critical applications, right? If I have a self-driving car that's driving in the road and it sees some new objects, uh, it's probably not a wise idea to hit it, even if it is something that maybe, you know, wouldn't be detrimental. So it's really important to go beyond this comfort zone. 
you might be asking yourself the question, well, do foundation models solve this problem, right? And the answer is no, of course not. Uh, foundation models like these large language models, these large vision plus language models, they still suffer from distribution shift issues. And one example of this is if I have highly specified data. If you think about having some remote sensing images collected from a satellite, they're going to look probably- Welcome to ICD 23, 225, D1, is the plenary source workshop from B2 is the plenary north workshop. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, as I was saying, right, foundation models are probably still going to suffer from these distribution shifts. And if I give it some type of image that it's never seen before, something like a satellite image, it's probably still not going to perform really well. So it's really hard to capture the full distribution of in the wild data. I repeat. <laughs> I'm a little worried to start again, but it's okay. All right, um, so what do we do? <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, how do we move beyond these comfort zones, right? What do we need to do to actually adapt? And in our minds, in this tutorial, we're gonna talk about two different types of adaptation. Uh, so the first is static adaptation, and the second is dynamic adaptation. And there's different pros and cons and different times that maybe you'd like to be using these different types. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by those. So with dynamic adaptation, we're thinking about methods that are able to adapt on the fly. So basically, given some stream of incoming data, they're able to exploit that stream and learn from it immediately to make updates and inferences about the world. So some examples of dynamic adaptation approaches include things like continual learning, open world learning, or even test time training, right? So there's many other examples, and these are specifically some of the ones that we're going to talk about today. Uh, on the other hand, we have static adaptation methods. So instead of adapting to data as it comes in on the fly, you can think instead about preparing the model in advance for unavailable semantic concepts, right? So some examples of this include things like zero shot or transfer learning, where I train this really large model that has a lot of knowledge about the world, but then I'd like to see how well it adapts uh, or generalizes to unseen concepts during the test time. Uh, so this is a really nice example, right? If our agent has learned about the concept stripes and the concept horse, is it able then at test time to identify uh, that a zebra is an animal that has stripes with horse attributes? <laughs> So just a little bit of formalization, here's what the space of problems and methods that we're gonna talk about look like. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different changes when we're uh, thinking about these problems. So did my prior change? Uh, did I have some type of covariate shift in the distribution, right? Maybe I have a lot of examples of one class in my training distribution, but now all of a sudden at test time, I have a lot of uh, different examples of something that was underrepresented or even things like semantic distribution shift, right? Do I need to learn new concepts over time and things like this? We're also gonna talk a little bit about what type of data is available, right? So beyond just supervised learning where I have labels, we could also think about unsupervised methods or transductive methods. And then what types of priors are assumed, right? For compositionality, are there certain types of compositions that we're providing a priori? Is there a vocabulary that we're providing that has a list of dictionary concepts that we expect the model to be able to work well on during test time? Uh, and then how are those methods actually being applied and used? So like I mentioned, we're gonna cover several different topics today. And these are a specific list of the different topics that we'll talk about. So you can see we've broken it into five different talks. Uh, the first three are related to dynamic adaptation methods. So Ricardo will talk about test time adaptation. I'll talk about lifelong and active learning. And then Jolt will talk about open world learning. And then in the second half of the tutorial, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some static adaptation methods. So Masi will talk about compositional zero shot learning, and then Ashwarya will give us a virtual talk on vision language learning. Uh, so here's a little bit of an outline of what the program looks like. Right now we're sitting in the introduction. We'll then have two talks before heading into some much needed coffee on a Monday morning. Uh, and then after that, we'll follow up with one more dynamic adaptation talk uh, before the two static adaptation talks. So without further ado, thank you and welcome to our tutorial.